Now, if you held up a cow horn to your ear, maybe you can imagine this. Has anyone here in the room held up a conch shell to their ear? I think most people have. Hold up a cow horn to your ear and you will hear that sort of a resonance and it's, it's humming. It's a dynamic pattern. Okay, it's not a substance, but it's a resonance that's going on like that. And if you had a material that you put in there and buried in the earth for six months, you can imagine how a, much of an, a resonant effect you're getting on whatever's in there. You can take clay and fill up a cow's horn and it will resonate on all of the materials in the clay and this creates a coherent effect that we see in quantum physics of entraining the chemistry so that there's what we call quantum entanglement. Everything is, acts as one. So, you're, yeah. now silica, let me just talk about silica. It works in the atmosphere with warmth and light. And we're gonna talk a little bit further on down the, the road about what's so important about warmth and light. And it's the atmosphere is where the plant's energy comes from. So, slides. <clears throat> this is where carbon enters the plant. If you're not catching carbon, then you're not going to build energy into your system, life energy. We're all carbon-based life forms. And photosynthesis, blossoming, fruiting, and ripening, lest we forget, occur in the atmosphere rather than in the soil. So what's going on in the atmosphere? The activities, the dynamic processes going on in the atmosphere are of primary importance. Carbon is the basis of life and that's where it enters the plant. Uh, lime, on the other hand, works in the soil with tone and life. Okay, this is why uh, you hold that horn up to your ear and you're hearing tone. You're hearing tone ether, so to speak. We'll talk about that a little bit more. The soil is exchanging minerals and proteins by way of the plant to the atmosphere in exchange for carbohydrates that the plant is sending down to the roots. So you want to have the carbon capture, the photosynthesis happening very well in the atmosphere and exchanging that with the soil and it's lime in the soil. We think of lime possibly as calcium. In uh, ordinary terms, it's calcium oxide, in chemist terms, rather. But it also includes magnesium, potassium, and your other cations in the soil. So the lime polarity is really talking about that cation exchange that's occurring in the soil. And it's not all just calcium, but there's a complex of things that do this. And that's the basis for your protein chemistry. That is what's essential for nitrogen fixation to take place. And, let's take this line. Uh, nitrogen is working on the lime polarity, and it enters the plant from the soil. So the plant is actually feeding energy two microbes living around its roots that are living in that lime polarity. And to some extent, this occurs within the plant's tissues, too. The atmosphere really starts at the boundary of the plant's tissues. So in a certain sense, the plant's internal material is a mound of soil that has been raised up. And so you actually have nitrogen fixation taking place as an internal intercellular activity within plant tissues and there are nitrogen fixing endophytes in the plant that travel up and down in the plant sap. And there's cultures, there's a mate of mine in Australia that has developed a culture called uh, 
twin end, and it's sprayed on plants around sundown down as a foliar to uh, get these endophytes established in the plant and around its roots. And it's been tested here on wheat farms in the U.S. and Canada and whatnot, and it's produced when it, when it works. It doesn't always infect the plant. There are other conditions that are necessary for this to occur, and this is why we, we, we would use biodynamic preparations to ensure that this works. All these are flowers of these preparations, right? Uh, these are representative of different things that might go into biodynamic preparations. But it's that uh, mineral release in the soil where you've got actually rocks that break down into smaller and smaller particles. And the life is always arising at the surfaces of these particles. So as you get more surface area developed, this is why clay is so important. And it provides very rich surface area. And these microbes that eat rocks and this sort of thing are actually living on the boundary zones in the soil and they're providing mineral release. And this is, must go on for nitrogen fixation to occur because nitrogen requires that lime polarity to balance out its acidity. Then there has to be that digestion occurring in the soil that takes those microbes that fix the nitrogen and digests them and releases their amino acids and then nutrient uptake can occur. And so these are soil processes that are occurring at the lime polarity. Okay, so clay is the moderator or mediator between the lime and the silica polarities. And so the key to getting these plants to grow like you saw the corn in the picture is to get a very dynamic interchange occurring with the plant between what goes on in the soil and what goes on in the atmosphere. So your photosynthesis blossoming, fruiting, and ripening has to have this interplay with the mineral release, nitrogen fixation, digestion, and nutrient uptake that occurs in the soil. And when that happens, you've got the equivalent of milk being taken up from the soil by the plant and the plant is giving the equivalent of honey back to the soil. And this has been used in some biodynamic uh, uh, spray preparation programs where just milk and honey have been part of the biodynamic spray sequence. So what's happening in clay is it has that give and take and it's both a daily or diurnal uh, rhythm and uh, annual rhythm. So we have seasonal and daily rhythms that are going on. And what's going on then is the warmth and light in the atmosphere are interacting with the tone and life in the soil. <clears throat> now what moderates this, I mean what this process is working with is humus formation. If you did a soil test and you measured, say on that soil test, your organic matter content, this is measured by measuring the carbon in the soil and multiplying by, I think it's 1.67, uh, or it's at least some factor in that range. So it's not actually measuring the organic matter content and it could be measuring charcoal in the soil. Charcoal is not a bad thing in the soil. It's sort of like a really good site for these surfaces, for these microbes to live on. But humus is actually not when you're composting. People think, commonly think, that composting is just a breakdown process and that somehow or another it stops at some point and it becomes stable as humus. But actually something like your um, cellulose is a chain sugar and if you broke it down, just kept breaking it down, 
it would become carbon dioxide and water, and you wouldn't have any organic matter buildup. But there are microbes in the soil that take these bits and piece them back together in these complex, very high molecular weight molecules called humic acids. And they tuck in, in that process, they tuck in amino acids and mineral chelates and tie them up in insoluble but available reserves. And those same microbes know how to access them. So when they need some of these stored goodies, then they have access to it and a plant comes along with a big seed, like a corn or a soybean seed, and it gives off of these like root exudates before it even gets sprouted. It gives off exudates. That's why you have to rinse the sprouts in your sprout jar. And this calls the microbes to the feast. They link up with the plant and then they can access their reserves of amino acids and minerals to get things really going. And so your actinomycetes and your mycorrhizal fungi that build this humic acid into the soil, they're the basis of generating this sort of flywheel of activity that gets the soil, soil really getting up a lot of momentum. And it's stored there, and it doesn't show up on your soil test. It's there in the soil. You do a soil test and it says, oh, you've got so much nitrate, so much ammonium. These are salt forms, ionic forms of nitrogen. And it may show you've got 10 parts per million nitrogen between the nitrate and ammonium. But a total test, an aqua regia digest that releases the uh, contents of the humic portion of the soil may show you have two or three thousand parts per million nitrogen and it's not soluble and it won't wash away with the next rain and it doesn't oxidize it's stable it'll stay there in that form for 30 years until something accesses it and if you keep building more into the soil and you get more and more momentum in that flywheel then you will have things that you plant will get off to a real jump of a start. I like to show uh, dung beetles with this because they naturally do this with the uh, excreta of larger animals such as sheep and goats and particularly cows. And you can see the population of dung beetles in this particular picture. Uh, they are burrowing into the soil, bringing up soil into the cow manure and they are bringing manure down into the soil where they lay their eggs. And <clears throat> this clay humus complex that is generated by the mixing of soil with your compostable materials is what generates humus. So humification actually relies on clay complexing these humus acid molecules. Uh, when we plant a seed in the soil and you have low levels of loose nutrients in the soil, a big seed, this is soybeans in the middle and corn in the side, this is at 21 days and the corn is this high. And the weeds, if you can see there, not myself, I have no concern about leaving weed seeds in the garden. Bring them on. If I ever need them, they're there. But in this picture, because the nutrient levels are low, the weeds are just struggling to get their first true leaf out. They've had their cotyledons out there for a couple of weeks, and this is how high they've grown, because they didn't have a microbial energy source in their seed. The corn and the soybeans did, and they called the microbes to the feast, and they got that symbiosis on a roll, 